Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching the channel. I greatly appreciate it. This week up, Samsung Electronics, the $400 billion consumer electronic giant that trades at the Korean Stock Exchange. We're going to translate their nine years of historical financial information into dollars. We're going to forecast the business and figure out what we can earn by buying the stock today. Let's get to work. All right, let's dive into Samsung Electronics. Before we do that, let's cover the five key attributes that we use to value all the stocks here in this, in this channel. And that would be top line revenue growth. We want to see a stock that's growing the top line. Earnings growth. We use EBITDA. We need EBITDA growing. We want strong free cash flow. We want low debt that's less than three times debt to EBITDA. And we want a well-priced stock. Well-priced, we use enterprise value to EBITDA as a well-priced metric. Now, Behind me is the 10K for Samsung in my hand. I've printed it and read it, and it's a great read. I highly recommend you go through it. The way they break down the business is very simple. It's easy to read, and they even translate the material into USD right in the 10K for you. Now, this stock is traded on the Korean Stock Exchange. It's not available trading in the US. You can buy it on the London Stock Exchange or the Luxembourg Stock Exchange if you don't want to set up an account in Korea to buy the stock. But let's take a look and read through this and figure out what we think the stock is worth in our financial model. Now, before we do that, like we always do, I want to go through the 10K and pull out a couple things for you because I thought they were fascinating. Also, this is in Korean won, so we have to deal with a little bit of Korean to dollar exchange, but I'm going to go through that pretty quickly. And I think you're going to find this fascinating. First up, the balance sheet. All right, behind me is the balance sheet from the 10K filed as of December 31st, 2020. This section here is in Korean won. This is 2020, year-end December, Korean won, 2019. Then they convert it into USD for you. The Korean won, as it states up here, is millions of Korean won. So this is 29 trillion won. The USD numbers are in thousands. So this is 24, 25 billion dollars. Okay, let's, I'll stick in dollars to make it simple from, from going forward. But cash and cash equivalents, one of my favorite line items, $25 billion in cash they have on their balance sheet. If I drop down a line below that, short-term financial instruments, that is just like cash. Those are short-term bonds. They could be treasuries, other government securities, but highly liquid assets, $78 billion. And then right below that, Short-term, uh, excuse me, yeah, short-term finan short-term financial assets at amortization cost. Another highly liquid asset, 2.3. This here is over 100 billion dollars in cash that they have on their balance sheet that they've generated through operating activity over time, which is amazing, amazing to see. We do not see companies with this much cash on the balance sheet aside from the behemoths, the, Go the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Berkshire Hathaways. Those guys have this kind of ch cash and so does Samsung Electronics. Kudos to them. That is quite the war chest. If we scroll down through the balance sheet to see how this stacks up, total current assets, $167 billion. And if I scroll down all the way through to get to total liabilities, total liabilities, only $86,000. So Ben Graham's going to like this company because total current assets, in fact, all cash can cover all liabilities and still have money to spare. That's a huge balance sheet check mark for us that they're running a clean balance sheet. They've, they have the cash that they store from, from operations. If you keep going down, you get the P&L, which itself is really simplified and clean, but it does show consistent profit before income tax every single year, which is really nice to see. I'm going to keep skipping through and go to the cash flow statement. Now, the cash flow statement is actually in, or these, all, all these financials are in Korean, get, Korean accounting standards, which is slightly different than GAAP, U.S. accounting, but the topics are roughly the same. You can still pull cash flow from operating activities. It varies slightly in that they've got dividend interest in here. Typically, that's excluded from the U.S. GAAP operating. That's a financing activity, but... It's, it's fine enough and it's positive and large, which is what we want to see. You can also pull out from investing activity, you can pull out property, plant, and equipment for your CapEx. That's a 30 
$2 billion annual CapEx investment. That's a big, big number. And then you've got the financing activity down below, which is almost nothing because they have very little debt. Okay, that is the balance sheet. Let's do a couple other things that I read that I was really surprised at, and then we'll get to the long-term financial outlook and forecast. But I'll, I'll go through very quickly, but I thought it was really interesting to see. Let's check this out. Okay, now behind me is a breakdown. It's way in the back of the 10K. I'm on page 87 of their 10K, but it basically breaks down the entire P&L by division. They're so big that even a division here is a monster, monster company, and we wanna figure out where do they derive most of the revenue and most of their earnings. And I know this is an eye chart, I'm sorry, it's the biggest I can get to because it's, it's spread horizontally, but basically you've got the consumer electronics division. These are in Korean won, so that's 110 trillion Korean won of total revenue, imaging 200 trillion won, so double the consumer electronics business, and then semiconductors total, 200 uh, trillion won. Uh, they've got a, a sound division, Harman, their speaker division, which is tiny compared to everything else. But the big takeaway for me is if total revenue is 540 trillion won, uh, a little lower than 50% of that is the semiconductor industry, which I did not know. I would have thought them as the electronics, the, the consumer electronics, the durable goods like washing machines and so forth, uh, imaging, not uh, semiconductors specifically, but the semiconductor is a monster, monster piece of their business and that drives a lot of their revenue and even their operating profit at 18 trillion won is about half the 35 trillion, so in line with, with, with revenue. They're mainly that, and then you've got the, the uh, imaging uh, technology, the IM business is the next runner up. So these two are really the lion's share of the business. Uh, okay, let's go one more thing. I found out that they have kind of a private equity portfolio inside the business. Let's go check that out. I think this will be really interesting. The last piece I want to go to before we do the financials is just look at their private equity portfolio. So they've been making investments in technology companies in, um, in and around their industry for many, many years. And I was really surprised to see one particular BYD, the electric car company that they own a tremendous amount of shares. They own one, $1 trillion dollars in Korean won of that business. Uh, in total, this portfolio would consist of a number of holdings, BYD being a large, large piece of it, in total is 7.3 trillion, which uh, won, and in USD is about $6 billion of a portfolio of equity investments that they have made in a lot of very interesting industries. Definitely check it out. This one happened to be a really hot one, and it caught, it caught my eye. But I like companies that take their cash and make equity investments in businesses that they have uh, either a vested interest in the sector, uh, like BYD, right, they're selling semiconductors into the electric car market. It makes sense for them to bet on one that's growing like that, and I like that. Okay, without further ado, let's go through and look at the financials. Now, what I've done here is I've pulled the Korean won financials for the, for, for the business, and I've converted them into USD using the average for the year exchange rate for the income statement and P&L items, and the December average for the balance sheet items. That's how you convert currency uh, ac across P&Ls. So let's take a look at revenue. Samsung Electronics, again, KSE is the ticker. You can find on the London Stock Exchange, the Luxembourg, or direct, go directly to uh, the, the Korean Stock Exchange. You can't buy it in the States, unfortunately. All these numbers are in millions of USD, fiscal year and December 31st. Check the revenue out. 2012, $178 billion, uh, all the way up to $200 billion, in 2020, that's a 1% growth rate, nothing to write home about. Technically checks our box in that it is a positive number, but it's not keeping up with inflation and it's really, really lackluster, I would think, for such a dynamic company. I kind of expected a bit more, but let's, let's keep going. EBITDA, EBITDA is our earnings for the company. That's what we wanna see, that's what we wanna see grow. And uh, it does grow 4.3% over time, $39 billion USD on $178 billion of revenue. That grows to $55 billion on 200 over time. A little bit of margin expansion is fantastic. Uh, and, and that rate is growing at 4%, which is a much, much better number than the top line 1% that they were getting before. So that at least is a much better item for us. If we forecast this forward, you might get a better feel for earnings growth. 
but they really got to work on that top line number. You can't, you can't always grow bottom line like that without some kind of movement on the top line. But I think technically both these check our box for growth. Let's go look at enterprise value. Enterprise value, we're going to begin with debt. Again, debt is almost nothing at $3 billion based on the EBITDA of $55 billion. That's, that's a drop in the bucket. And what I really like is this excess cash here, $81 billion. Again, for me, I'm just using excess being the, uh, the, the, the short-term investments and, the, uh, and the, the short-term investments at asset cost. Those two I'm adding up, converting to dollars, and that's what I'm getting. Uh, I did my own dollar conversion across history. I didn't use their dollar in their 10K. I used the Korean won in the 10K and converted it to keep my methodology similar from, from 10K to 10K. But I got about $81 billion of excess cash, not total cash. Total cash was 100, a little 100 billion. I left 20 cash in the business and I kept 80 that I can say I can dividend that out and the business has enough cash to continue to run itself and do what it needs to do. This is true excess cash. Market cap, shares outstanding times price, gives me the market cap. I add debt to market cap and I subtract excess cash. I get the enterprise value of Samsung Electronics and that last fiscal year is quarter trillion dollars, 247 billion up from 140, 133 billion. And recently it's peaked. It seems like the stock has shot up a little bit with the semiconductor shortage that we're currently in. I think investors are going to the stock a little bit and you've got almost a 50% uh, move in the enterprise value, just shy of $400 billion. Uh, debt to EBITDA, our risk of bankruptcy measure, right? I think we cover that extensively by looking at the balance sheet, it's zero. Uh, they have so much excess cash, it wipes out everything of that. Enterprise value to EBITDA is our value metric. Uh, you can use lots of other value metrics. This is one that I've used because I've seen lots of private equity investment banking decks and pitch books and companies announce acquisitions, multiples based on this metric. So I like to put this metric in there as a grounding for what is value or not. Uh, you're seeing a enterprise value of 2.5 times on the low to high more recently seven times of a turning of EBITDA. And that is really, really cheap. Uh, we've seen numbers like 10x typically on growth stocks, 25, 30, something extreme would be 40, 50 times if something's really growing. This is not growing. So you're not going to get the growth multiple, but to have, a, to have a payback period of three years is way too cheap in my mind. So there must be something going on. We're going to cover that in a second. But I, the, this to me stands out as a very low market multiple. But you can see the range historically here has been say four and a half to say two and a half times over the last nine years. And recently it's popped up seven, which is a big difference between what, what it's traded at historically. All right, let's take a look at cash flow, the favorite statement, my favorite statement, and we'll see where this investment stacks up. Cash flow from operations, $33 billion in 2012, has grown to $55 billion over this time period. That's a 6% annualized growth rate, which is much closer to the EBITDA growth rate that we saw historically, which means that again, accounting expenses on the P&L are following cash flow, which is what we wanna see that's just good. The reason why people say EBITDA is a poor proxy for cash flow, and it is a poor proxy for cash flow, but it's useful because we have lots of market data reported on EBITDA. It's one reason I use it, but we always smell check it by looking at this CapEx minus cash flow. This is cash flow, and you've got 30 billion dollars a year that Samsung puts back into its enterprise to build out foundries for semiconductors for growth, to invest in imaging technology and dishwashers, all that stuff that takes tremendous capital. And this capital must be spent to replace uh, worn out equipment. And it's not in the EBITDA number. And interestingly enough, if I take 55 billion, which is close to the EBITDA they had last year at 55, and I subtract $30 billion, right? That is EBITDA less CapEx. That gives me about $20 billion. $20 billion against an enterprise value of $250 billion is basically 10 to 11 times 
You follow me? So, it's, so if I adjust EBITDA for the fact that it does not have CapEx in it, net the two, I get a lower EBITDA, which means this market multiple is a little higher, almost double, 10 times. That 10X is a much more realistic EBITDA market multiple for a company that isn't growing. The difference is that EBITDA does not have CapEx in it, and you always want to check CapEx as your true measure of cash flow. That's why we do this sheet. So when we're looking at cash flow, we take cash flow from operations less CapEx. Debt is almost zero. This is free cash flow. This is what the business is actually based on. The cash flow from equity is the, the pure cash, hard money that the business generated from selling its product and then after reinvesting for growth for next year and then after paying off debt. This is the number, $24, $25 billion is free cash flow. It's both large and positive every year. We like that and it's growing at 8% a year. That's a nice growth rate on free cash flow. It's very, very strong. What do they use with, what do they do with that free cash flow? Well, one, they're making equity investments that you saw in their equity portfolio. Two, they're buying back their own shares over time. They're reducing the share count outstanding. And three, they dividend some of the money out. Uh, and four, it just stacks up on the balance sheet. So strong free cash flow, buying back shares. If I look at the share price per average and the yield, there's a strong kind of strong single digit yield that you're getting on this stock around 8% annually is a very good single digit yield for a company that doesn't grow. Top line, they, they grow EBITDA. Okay, so now we've got a company that's got low, weak, low growth, but it's positive, no debt, strong free cash flow yield, high cash flow multiple, and now we understand the difference between why EBITDA multiple looks so low is because EBITDA is missing CapEx. When we adjust EBITDA for the cost of CapEx, the market multiple goes up to around 10 or 12, and that's a much more normalized, if you will, uh, market multiple for a company that isn't growing. Now we understand the business. Now, now we can forecast. So let's forecast EBITDA first. I'm gonna pick up this EBITDA number and I'm gonna use these averages because I know if I keep the averages relative to where they historically, that assumes the same CapEx is gonna go out and I don't have to adjust everything for the lack of the CapEx. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up the EBITDA growth rate that we had before, 4.3%. I'm gonna grow their EBITDA 4.3% every year for the next decade and I'm gonna apply the average market multiple of 3.7 that they've currently experienced to that EBITDA and I get $311 billion enterprise value, less little debt, plus some cash, the historical averages. Uh, I get a market cap of 400 billion, divide by the shares outstanding currently and I get a $59 price target out 10 years for Samsung Electronic. Same thing for free cash flow. So free cash flow, I'm picking up last year's free cash flow number per share, and I'm growing it at a higher rate because this is the average growth rate of the cash flow from operations that they have experienced. And I'm pulling this number to be a true measure of cash flow for them. 3.9 to $7.48 per share of free cash flow. I applied eight and a half uh, market multiple yield to the free cash flow based on what they've had historically right here. And I get a future price of $88.34. Now, if I combine those two forecasts, right, we've got two different methods, an EBITDA market multiple and a free cash flow per share method. I average those two and I get a $73 future price target. I look into the market and I can currently buy it at $70. So it's not a huge impact. What you're gonna get on the IRR is gonna be only the cash flow yield essentially that you're gonna get on the company. Basically assuming that the money is dividend, if it's not dividend out and it sits on the balance sheet, much like we correct enterprise value for the cash on the balance sheet, the market will respond and lift the share price for the amount of cash that they have on the balance sheet and it will be reflected in a higher future stock price if they don't dividend this money out. I'm assuming that dividend is out for simplicity to make the math work out, but that's essentially what would happen in real life. Now, I buy in at 70, I get a stream of cash flow, I'm out at 73, that's a 9% annualized IRR on this investment over time. 
basically a little over 1.8 times cash on cash return for this investment. If I put it into a distribution chart, $71 current price for, per share, 9% IRR. If it drops down, I think it gets attractive at the $50 range going up to 90, it's way, way too out of market. Behind me is the math that we just went through, right? It's historical forecast, IRRs, chunk of the math, and it's kind of a, a meh. If, if I were to give it something, anything, it's a meh. It's not high enough to really be excited. It's not low enough to really you know hate on it. It's just kind of lackluster. Uh, if we review our five key attributes, top line, yes, it's positive. It is your it checks the box. EBITDA is positive. It's growing. It checks the box. Strong free cash flow, yes, check the box. Low debt, yes. Enterprise value is cheap because the return here is mediocre. So I'm giving it a meh. Now, that's the math. When I did a little research online, I came up with a startling fact that I was not aware of. The owner, original founder of the company, owner of the president, recently passed away. And his son inherits the company. And his son just went to prison for six years for bribery charges in Korea. Or he's currently in, in, in let, me, let me, he's alleged to have done this because he's still in trial. But I believe the sentence was, was, was handed out. He just hasn't yet gone to jail yet. But he is going to, going to jail. And the company, as a result, for the last couple of years, has been kind of spooling, waiting for the trial to be done and waiting for this individual to come back to lead the company, which for me is a huge red flag. First off, if he's even being accused of bribery, I'm out, let alone being convicted of bribery, I'm out. Second, if that's just what they convicted him on, who knows what else he might be doing or capable of doing in the future if he has his hands on this company that we have put our money in. So if the company itself is a meh, but then you add on top of that the drama with the management and the risk about having someone running a business who could potentially be engaged in fraudulent or illegal activity with the company you bought in, I'm giving it an ugly. I'm not putting my money anywhere near someone who has been accused of something like this. So for us at the channel, it's a huge pass. I really, really wanted to find a stock that's in the semiconductor space that is outside the United States, that has its business in a different exchange. Uh, I really want that diversification for my own portfolio. And I really liked the dominance, the size, the relatively cheap value uh, of this business, the free cash flow. Uh, but A, I think the recent price run up has expanded the market multiple. It's a little too price, it's a little too high anyways right now. And then given the forecast of, of only you know 4% growth. And then on top of that, to, to read this about the, uh, the executive team, it's a huge pass. We're moving on to something else. But definitely take a look at the 10K, read through because it's a great exercise. Uh, and we'll just move on to the next company. Now, as always do, I wanna thank you for very much watching the channel. All the comments, subscribers, I greatly appreciate it. If you're looking for value stocks, check out the comments down below. They are off the chain. Everybody's pinging in amazing stocks. I'm trying to get to them. It's very difficult to do them all. I try to do one a week. If you'd like to do this on your own, you can check out in the description of this channel. I have a course that I offer where I provide this template to you and I teach you how to go through a 10K like a Samsung, pull out the relevant material, punch in the numbers, create a forecast, and how to think about holding investments long-term such as this to maximize your IRR. That's a course that I produced. Uh, look at the description for the link, check it out. I hope you enjoy it. Outside of that, thank you very much for all the time, the consideration. I greatly appreciate the support. Uh, keep subscribing, give me the comments, tell me what you want to see, and we're going to do something fun next week. This is Cameron Stewart from Rational Investing. Thank you very much. Goodbye.